Well, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 29. The title of our Bible study is A Call to Listen to Jesus. We have been making our way through this uh, letter, through this book to the Hebrews. Uh, the last few weeks we looked at chapter 11 and saw the Hall of Faith. And last week we saw the conclusion of that because of their witness and their encouragement that we should run our race that we should get in the game, that we should follow the Lord with our whole hearts. And we'll see some of that exhortation continues here in the latter part of chapter 12. And we'll see uh, really four different themes uh, as we take a look at the, the latter part of here, chapter 12. Uh, in verses uh, 12 through 13, we'll see the theme of uh, get strong. Uh, verses 14 through 17, we'll see get right. Verses 18 through 24, we'll see get bold. And then verses 25 through 29, we'll look at watch out. And so uh, a lot of exhortation here in chapter 12, and we'll see some more uh, next week in uh, chapter 13. But with that, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, picking up in verse 12. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees. And make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. We'll pause there. As Bible students, we've learned any time in Scripture, we see the word therefore. We're to ask the question, what? What is the therefore? Therefore. In light of what we looked last week, that sometimes we have suffering, sometimes we go through discipline, we're not to give up. We're not to lose heart. We're to ask the question, Lord, what are you trying to teach me as I'm going through this trial? What are you trying to show me as you're trying to grow me through this? So in light of the reminder last week about suffering, we're therefore exhorted to get back on the straight path and start running again. It's almost like a military officer. Uh, the author here tells uh, his team, or maybe even a coach of a team, you could say, to get with it. To get back in the game, right? To, to get off the, the sidelines and, and let's go. Um, and we looked at some reasons last week that he gave us to be strong in the Lord, to put off the discouragement. And here we see now is the time to do it. Now is the time to, to get our whole hearts in following the Lord, to get strong and, and, and have that heart to want to walk with the Lord. It's almost like a long distance runner. If you've ever watched someone a long distance, sometimes they will trip and fall. Sometimes they'll step in a hole and they'll sprain an ankle and they'll fall down. But they get back up, right? They keep going. They realize this is not the finish line. The finish line's a ways off. I got to get up and keep running my race. Uh, and the same is true for us in our Christian walk with the Lord. Sometimes we fall down and God is there with us every step of the way. In fact, he will help pick us back up dust us off, and encourage us to keep going. Keep following Him. And, and, and that's the great thing about knowing the Lord, is, is He's with us every step of the way. He's there to help us to get strong as we follow Him. So we need this, this new grip uh, with our tired hands to, to strengthen our weak knees, to make a straight path for our feet so those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. And the truth of the matter is that our strength is in the Lord. Sometimes our culture will tell you to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You know, that you can get this power from within you to, to do it. And that lasts for like maybe an hour or a day or a week. And then you're down again. But our strength is in the Lord. He is like the wind in our sails that keeps us going. That encourages us. That lifts us up. And so the way that we get strong is in the Lord. As we walk with Him. As we get to know Him. And so in verses 14 through 17, we see the next, the next exhortation, which is to get right. We see that we're to pursue peace with all people. And holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spreading up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. We'll pause there for just a moment. What's interesting here is 
is this word to pursue peace with all people. And in my Bible, I underline the word all. Because sometimes as Christians, you know, I don't have a problem with pursuing peace with people that are peaceable. But what about that neighbor or that coworker or that person that just irritates you? Am I to try and pursue peace with that person? Yes. <laughs> Doesn't mean you become best friends with them, but that you try your very best to get along with them. There are people that I call sandpaper people that kind of rub you the wrong way. They kind of irritate you, you know. And, and the Lord is rubbing off the, the rough edges on us through those people sometimes. And we want to do our best to pursue peace with people. We should work at getting along with each other and with the Lord. Work at living in peace with everyone and, and work at living a holy life. Now what's fascinating is the word here, holiness is also the word we could translate separated. We're called to be holy or separated from this world unto the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us to be holy as He is holy. He wants us to be separate from the things that bring defilement so that we can be closer to Him. And so God's desiring that we would be close to Him. That we would be separate from the world for God's exclusive use. And it's by His grace that allows us to be close to Him. And a lack of holiness is a very critical obstacle to a close relationship with God. If we're clinging on to sin rather than clinging to the cross of Christ, there's going to be a hindrance in our relationship. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, who's known as the Prince of Preachers, had this to say about holiness. He said, Unholy Christians are the plague of the church. They are spots in our feasts of charity. Like hidden rocks, they are the terror of navigators on the water. It is hard to steer clear of them. There is no telling what wrecks they may cause. We want to make sure that we're not clinging to things that we shouldn't be clinging to, but that we're clinging to the Lord. Again, if we're in this long distance race, we want to make sure we're holding on to the right things, holding on to the Lord. And it starts with getting right with God. And the way we do that is we surrender our life to Him. We realize that I am a wretch. I am a sinner in need of grace. We come to the cross. We realize that God loves us. He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried in the tomb. He was really dead. And He rose from the grave. He's got power over the grave. And He wants to forgive us and wants a relationship with us. So we receive that free gift by, by grace. God's unmerited favor. And we need to look diligently to keep both ourselves and others from either returning to legalism or returning to those sins that, that can, can bind us and, and, and carry us away. We want to make sure that we're holding on to the Lord. We want to make sure that it's either, that if we either have the outward form or the inward attitude, uh, that, that we're looking forward to having the, God's grace live in us and through us. If we don't experience the grace of God, and we don't let that grace permeate through our lives, what can happen is a root of bitterness can spring up and cause trouble. And we see that here in verse 15. We need to look uh, towards the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Bitterness can come sometimes when we don't understand the ways of the Lord. Our trials in life, the things that we face, can either make us bitter or better. If you're facing a very difficult circumstance, sometimes people will, will put up their fist and be angry at God, and they'll become bitter. God, why are you letting me go through this? I don't understand this. I'm so angry at you. Other people realize, where else am I going to go? He's, he's my only hope. This is, this is something i got to lean into the Lord and trust Him. And it actually makes them better. They have a closer intimacy with the Lord more than any of us will ever, ever understand. I mean, to see them walk through this trial, to see the, the heartache and the suffering they go through, and yet the joy and the love that they have in the Lord, it's an encouragement to the rest of us. And, and it makes them a better Christian. They're, they're closer to the Lord as they go through that. So we get to choose in our trials. Are we going to let that trial make us bitter or better. And if we let it make us bitter, the truth of the matter is, is 
those around us become miserable too. We kind of drag other people down as well. So that bitterness corrupts many people. It's often rooted in a sense of personal hurt. And many hold on to that bitterness with amazing stubbornness. What we need to do is experience the grace of God to understand how much God has forgiven us. And then to start extending that grace and that forgiveness towards others. It's loving the undeserving. And that's exactly what God has done to, towards us. Is He's loved us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And one of the parables Jesus told in the Gospels, he talked about this master who had a, a servant who owed him millions of dollars. It was such a big debt. And uh, he called him out on this debt and said, you need to pay this back. And the servant said, I, I can't. There's no way. And the master said, well, you're going to go to jail. You're going you're gonna to earn. You're going to pay off this debt. He said, please forgive me. I've got a family. Uh, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll work. I'll, just please forgive me this debt. I'll, I'll, I'll make it up to you. And that master was moved with compassion. said, you know what? I'm going to forgive you your debt. You are free to go. Debt has been, has been canceled. Uh, don't worry about it. You're free. And, and Jesus said that servant went and found a servant who owed him, him some money. Maybe a $10 or 100 bucks. Maybe it was a dollar. Begin to choke him and say, hey, you need to pay me back what you owe me. You need to give me that money. And he said, have pity on me. Have patience. Please forgive me. I'll, I'll, I'll work. I'll do whatever I can to pay back this debt. I've got a family. Please, please work with me. And he said, no. And he put him in jail. And when news came back to, to the master about what his servant did, he said, you wicked and lazy servant. I forgave you all this debt. And you couldn't forgive your servant. Put him in jail. And Jesus gives this whole parable, this whole illustration about forgiveness. That he has forgiven us from so much sin, from so much guilt and shame. And that we should be forgiving those around us. It's not easy, I can tell you that. But with the Lord's help and in time, we can learn and choose to forgive people that offend and, and people that hurt us. And we have to do that. If we don't, that bitterness is going to take over. And it's going to affect our lives. And it's going to affect those that we care around us. So the idea here is the grace of God is going to help us to forgive. And that grace of God is going to change and transform our lives. And that grace of God we should be extending to other people. And also that the grace of God helps us to move on past the pain, past the hurt, to help us keep walking and growing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to keep a sharp eye out for these weeds of bitter discontentment. You know, a thistle or two gone to seed can ruin your whole garden in no time. We want to make sure we get right with our moral conduct. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 8, in the Sermon on the Mount, that there are blessings reserved only for the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We want that purity. We want that heart of forgiveness with the Lord. Well, verses 16 to 17, we'll see that we're to watch out for something I would call the Esau syndrome. And we see it says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. The Esau syndrome is trading away God's lifelong gift in order to satisfy a short-term appetite. It's like impulse shopping or going grocery shopping on an empty stomach and just grabbing everything and putting it in your cart. It's not thinking long term. It's, it's making poor decisions off of feelings. And Esau had shown his spiritual indifference when he sold his birthright for food that his brother made. In fact, his name Esau means hairy and later it would be Edom, which means red. Because he sold his birthright for a, a stew of red lentil beans. And uh, I don't know how hungry he was, but he wasn't going to die. Uh, but he gave in. He really despised his birthright. He was more concerned with the now and here than the, the everlasting birthright. The eternity uh, blessing that God had given to him. 
And many Christians today sell their birthright of intimacy with God as cheaply as Esau sold his birthright. They, they want something quick versus the closeness with the Lord. Now, it's not a question of forgiveness because God's forgiveness is always available. But with Esau, he regretted his impulsive act, right? He wanted God's blessing, but by then it was too late. Tears or no tears. And Esau wasn't crying tears of repentance. He was crying because he lost the blessing. And his birthright wasn't restored simply because he wanted it back. It could never be regained because he despised it. He wanted the blessings and the benefits from God without really walking or knowing God. And sadly, there are many Christians today like that. They want all the blessings of God, all the benefits, but they don't really want to walk with Him or really know Him or follow Him. And so we want to make sure we we don't sell our birthright of intimacy with God, as Esau did. We don't want to despise what we have in the Lord. We want to make sure we don't walk away from God, but that we, we follow Him with our whole hearts. That we make sure that we're getting right with the Lord. That we have that right relationship with Jesus Christ. That personal, intimate relationship. Well, in the next section here, we'll see a contrast between how we uh, come to God in the New Testament compared to how people came to God in the Old Testament. We'll see a contrast of of these two mountains. And we'll take a look at that here uh, in verses 18 through 24 in this section about getting bold. Verse 18 says, For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and burned with fire, into blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. We'll pause there for just a moment. In Exodus chapter 19, there's this um, revelation that God gives to Moses and to the people that he is holy. And that to come to Mount Sinai, uh, one had to be very careful how they would approach Uh, the mountain was essentially fenced off and there was uh, no trespassing on pain of death. Even animals that went near uh, would die. And so the people under the old covenant asked Moses to please be the mediator between them and God. They were afraid of the Lord, afraid of his presence. And they heard this awesome trumpet blast and the voice they, they felt was so terrible at Mount Sinai. They begged God to stop speaking. They were so afraid. And they heard the words, even if an animal touches the mountain, it's as good as dead. They were, they were afraid to move. And we see even Moses was terrified and trembling. And, and the Lord humbled people through that experience. In fact, we read in the Old Testament, Moses was the humblest guy that ever lived. And he... He realized that the only way I can approach God is on his terms, on his ways. And it's through his prescribed way that he desires a holy relationship with him. So this was the Old Testament. We don't approach God this way. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fear that his words are terrifying. We have a different way. We have a better way through Jesus to approach And we see a a different mountain that's contrasted here in verses 22 through 24. Verse 22 says, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven, and to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. We're in a different place. Our relationship with God is not modeled after Israel's experience on Mount Sinai. We come to a different mountain, Mount Zion. 
Now, Mount Zion is the city where the living God resides. Um, it was uh, Zion is the name of a hill upon which Jerusalem sits. It's also a spiritual city we see throughout Scripture. It is a heavenly Jerusalem um, where the Lord inhabits and where the angels dwell. We see it's populated with many joyful angels and also, and also Christian citizens are there. And it's a city where God is the just judge. You come to God himself and he's the judge over all things. He's judged our sins at the cross. They're forgiven. And we have this relationship with him. So the author of the book of Hebrews is reminding the Jewish Christians and us, we're exhorted to not even consider going back to preferring that the religion of Mount Sinai and the law to the relationship of Mount Zion and the grace that we have in the Lord. The whole purpose of the law, we look at this, is to bring us to the Messiah, to show us our sinfulness, that we need forgiveness. And that's in Jesus Christ. So the exhortation is to, to not go back, but to, to keep moving forward in the Lord. You have come to Jesus, who has given us the new covenant. He's the mediator of this better new covenant. And it says here that as God's children... Our names are written in heaven. It gives us the rights of citizenship in the kingdom. Right? Verse 23. The firstborn who are registered in heaven. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. If you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, if He's your Savior and your Lord, you're born again. God's Spirit lives within you. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You are registered in heaven. You've made your reservation. Smoking or non-smoking? <laughs> you said, I, I, I want non-smoking, please. I want to go to heaven. I want Jesus Christ. And that reservation has been, been made. It can't be canceled. God is waiting for us to be with Him. Absent from this body to be present with the Lord forever in heaven. So we have this huge blessing in the Lord. Why would we want to disregard that for something else? This is a question that my wife asked uh, a lady who knocked on our door about six months ago uh, from a a cult. And uh, she wanted us to give up what we had in the Lord to do works. To go knock on doors with her and hand out magazines. And she said, why would I give up the grace that I have in Jesus for uncertainty? That doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to do that. That's crazy. That's crazy. And the same is true here. Why will we give up what we have in the Lord for something else? We have everything we need in Jesus Christ. We have this beautiful relationship with the judge of the universe, the creator. And we get to have fellowship with him. And it's all through Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Now, remember in Genesis, when Abel's blood was spilled, it was through murder, right? His brother Cain was vengeful, didn't get right with the Lord, and murdered his own brother. And sometimes people wrestle with, why is there crime in our world? Is it, is it lack of parenting? Is it environment? Uh, is it nurture? We see that those who were as close to God, Adam and Eve... Right? Almost perfect parents, but not quite perfect. They sinned. Their own kids committed murder. I mean, how, how, how much can we wrestle with that nurture and, and nature? And maybe it's a combination of both. But it's really a hard issue. That if you don't want to know the Lord, you're going to do what you want to do. If you don't have a right relationship with God, you're going to think, I get to run the universe. I'm going to live life the way I want to live. And I don't care about anyone else. And we see that there were people in the day of Jesus who wanted um, not there to be a riot. And they allowed him to essentially be murdered uh, on the cross for us. But the death of Jesus was completely different. The murder of Abel cries out for vengeance. But the death of Jesus has a proclamation of grace. Jesus establishes the new covenant, which speaks of God's mercy, God's forgiveness, and the grace of God that's extended to us. It's through the blood that Jesus poured out on the cross that our sins are forgiven. 
that we can have that right relationship with Him, that we can have boldness to come to the throne of grace, that we can come directly to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are some uh, groups out there that believe you can't go directly to the Lord. You've got to go through a saint, which is already dead, or you've got to go through a special person and confess to them and those sort of things. The Bible tells us we can go directly to the Lord. We have direct access. We can have boldness at that throne of grace to receive help in time of need. Why would we want to give that up for something else? We can go directly to the Lord. We can have boldness. That we can come to Jesus, our mediator. We can receive everything we need. We can receive all the help. We have all the spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus So we want to make sure we get bold and knowing what we have in Jesus, that we have that relationship, that we can call upon him any time we need help. Well, next we'll see this exhortation to watch out. We'll see that here in verses 25 through 29. And we read here in verse 25, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying once more, I shake not not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of the things that are being shaken, as of the things that are made that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. We'll pause there for just a moment. If we refuse to get strong in the Lord, to get right with the Lord, to have a bold relationship with the Lord, then we should not be ignorant of the consequences. We need to watch out uh, because there are going to be consequences. If people reject the Lord Jesus Christ, they are cut off from hope. They are cut off from the way of salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me or by me in John 14, 6. There's only one way to be saved. And again, we live in a culture where many people want relativism. Well, that's good for you, but but I found something that works for me. It doesn't work that way. I mean, that's like saying drive 10 minutes any direction and you'll get to my house. It's not going to happen. If you don't know where I live, you're not going to get there. That's like saying go to any bank in the town, type in any four-digit PIN, and you'll get money out of my bank account. It's not going to happen. You've got to know where I bank. You've got to know my PIN, which I'm not going to give you. It's not much there anyways. But that's relativism. right? But the Bible tells us there's absolute truth. There's one way to the Father. And as I've thought about this, I'm actually very thankful that there even is a way. I mean, God could have just said, I'm done with humanity. Done. You're on your own. But no, he loved us so much. He sent his one and only son to forgive us. To forgive us. To have a relationship with him. And that's the beautiful thing that God has done. So Jesus is the one we're to listen to. Right? God spoke through Moses on the earth. On the Old Testament. And the prophets. And the people, if they didn't obey what they said or obey the laws. They were, they were separate from the Lord. But Jesus came directly from heaven to give God's message to us. And we should consider his message even more carefully. In Mark chapter 9, there's this beautiful picture of what we call the Mount of Transfiguration. Where Jesus takes a few of his disciples, um, Peter, James, and John, to this this mountain. And, And we see that there's Moses and Elijah talking with them. And Peter kind of, you know speaks before he thinks, and he says, hey, that's great. Let's build some tabernacles. Let's build some housing places here for Moses and Elijah. This is great. And this voice comes out of the cloud and says, this is my beloved son, who I am well pleased. Hear him. And then the clouds disappear, and it's Jesus only. It's the picture of what we need. We need to hear Jesus only. We need to look to him only. He's the one we're to listen carefully to. So we, want, we don't want to turn a deaf ear to the gracious words of the Lord. There were people who ignored the warnings in the Old Testament. They didn't get away with it. 
And the exhortation here is, what will happen to us if we ignore the heavenly warnings through Jesus Christ? That He's came to rescue us. We want to be careful not to refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. The one who has come to rescue us. Now, when God spoke on Mount Sinai, His voice shook the earth. And we read that He makes another promise. That once again I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. And this promise comes from Haggai uh, chapter 2, verse 6. One of the, what we would call, minor prophets in the Old Testament. That there's going to be this shaking. And we see that he's going to shake not only the earth once more, but also heaven. There's going to be this shaking going on. God's going to clean house once and forever. This means that all the creation will be shaken, so that only the things of God and the people of God will remain. There are things that people amass for themselves on this earth, and yet they can't take it with them into eternity. You've heard about the guy who uh, somehow got away with uh, God allowing him to take one bag into heaven, and, and he gets to the pearly gate where St. Peter is, and he, he says, would you mind kind of showing me what you got there because you're not supposed to let it? And he says, oh yeah, God says it's okay. All right, well, show me what you got. And he opens it up and it's gold. And he's like, great, you brought pavement. We need more pavement here in heaven, right? We can't take anything materially with us. I mean, the only thing we can take with us to heaven is, is other people, those we care about. So everything here, it, we need to have a light grip on. And we see that here in verses 28 and 29. Therefore, since we are to receive, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. The author of the book of Hebrews is saying, you see what we've got? We've got an unshakable kingdom. We have this relationship with the Lord. But if our lives revolve around material things, the things that are here and now, they're going to be shaken. Those things are going to be gone. They're, they're not going to endure forever. And so we want to make sure that we're not so caught up in material things. Otherwise, we will lose everything. We should keep a light touch with the world and aim to be uh, unspotted from the world, as we'll see in James in a few weeks. So, we're receiving this kingdom that's unshakable. We're exhorted to be thankful and to please God by worshiping Him with holy fear and awe. And not only to have a heart of thankfulness, but to really be overflowing with a heart of worship. To have that deep reverence, respect, and awe for the Lord. We, we don't have a relationship where we're terrified from the Lord. We do have a godly fear, though, where we love Him so much we don't want to hurt Him. Right? We, we love Him and we want to please Him. We want to walk with Him. And because our God is a consuming fire. He alone is the one who is holy who makes us holy so that we can be with them forever. In closing, next week we'll finish our study in the book of Hebrews. We'll look at chapter 13. We'll look at some age-abiding principles. But the truth is that, again, our God is a consuming fire. And really that should be a comfort to us as believers because we realize that the Father poured out His consuming fire on judgment on His Son on the cross. And when he did that, it completely consumed the guilt of sin for all of us who believe. The penalty of sin was consumed in holy judgment upon Jesus on the cross. That sin offering was consumed by the Father. All the judgment, all the wrath that we deserve for our sins was put on Jesus Christ. And now because of that, we have boldness to come to the Lord. We have direct access with the Father. We have a relationship with the Lord forever. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the exhortation that we want to get strong. That we need to find our strength in you as we are in this long distance run. This long distance journey with you. 
that we want to make sure we get right, that we have a right relationship with you, and that we have a, a good relationship with those around us as well. And that, Lord, you'd help us to get bold, to have the boldness to know that we can come right to your throne anytime we need help, that we can pray and talk to you, the creator of the universe, anytime we want. We can go to your word and receive comfort and encouragement and wisdom and guidance for our lives anytime we desire your word is available to us. And that, Lord, we should watch out. Now, we should watch out for not rejecting your words. Now, we should watch out because this world wants to, to pull us away from you. We say in that song earlier, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Lord, here's our heart. Would you take it and seal it for your courts above? Would our hearts be so close to you? That we just fall more and more in love with you. And Lord, we pray this morning, if there be any here among us, as every Christian prayed, as every head is bowed, Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who has yet to surrender their life to you, yet to make you their Savior and the Lord of their life, that by your Spirit you'd be convicting them of their sin, convincing them of your amazing grace for them. If that's you this morning and you're ready to surrender your life to the Lord, I want to encourage you to, to pray to the Lord. I'm simply going to lead you in a prayer where you make that decision, where you ask God to forgive you for your sins, to come into your heart, to come into your life, to be your Savior and your Lord. And if you're ready to do that this morning, I want to simply encourage you to repeat this prayer after me and mean it in your heart. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I realize that my sin separates me from you. And I believe that Jesus came to this earth, lived that perfect, sinless life, that he died on the cross for my sins, that he was buried and rose from the grave. God, I ask that you'd forgive me of all my sin. Forgive me from all the mistakes I've made. Wash me clean. Make me whiter than snow. Jesus, I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you for loving me. I thank you for being my Savior, my Lord, and my friend. And I pray from this day forward, you'd help me to follow you. By your Spirit, empower me to follow you. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.